Mein Name ist Ines Kappert, ich leite das... So, mein Name ist Ines Kappert und ich bin der Head of the Gunnar Werner Institute, GWI in brief. The GWI is the feminist think tank of the Heinrich Böhr Foundation in Berlin. At the moment there are 12 of us and we work on various focus points on reproductive justice, feminist digital policy, anti-feminism and feminist foreign policy, and also feminism for the post-migrant society. And especially in this context, for years we've tried to draw attention to the particularly vulnerable situation of people on the move. And this is also uh, done in collaboration with Menja Chela, professor of anthropology at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York. And she's a... Uh, no, I'm going to wait for another second because there, a few people came in and need receivers. Okay, so everybody's ready, so I'm going to resume. So, to, for five years we've cooperated with Menja Chala, Professor of Anthropology at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and she's also my Grayson researcher and is doing exactly what we represent to bring together different discourses, in her case, gender and migration, so you know that these are discourse strands that very often run in parallel and it is our intention to bring them together and to have a fruitful um, exchange and this is what we will do today and this is also what we've tried to do over the past six years. So beyond that, Menja has, apart from her scientific work, also has a scientific uh, activistic uh, side. She co-founded the Queer European Asylum Network. And this is also the reason why we, since 2019, have conducted an expert conference on the situation of refugees and of people on the move. So it's very important to us, and I think uh, we will also see this today, that we do not talk about people on the move, but that we also invite them and um, in the GWI, we usually try to bring together politicians, activists, and decision makers, and also the academia. This year, our focus is artificial intelligence, or also the use of artificial intelligence for the EU border protection. And we are quite happy that Francesca Schmidt, the co-founder of Nets Former, has been a part for the conceptualizing team. And apart from that, Francesca has worked for the GWI for many years and is currently the spokesperson at the Federal um, sorry, um, Agency for Political Education and for Transformative um, Knowledge. So the EU invests billions of Europe into research projects that will fully digitize the border processing um, after smart cities, now smart borders are supposed to come. Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has assured that the following would have the highest priority when it comes to the utilization of AI. So it should be human-centered, transparent, and used in a responsible way. How this might look like or how this will not be the case is reflected in the research project Row Border, the aim of which is to develop a fully autonomous border surveillance system. This includes unmanned robots, I quote again, uh, vehicles for the air, for the water surface, for underwater, for the ground, which operate both independently and in swarms. The project ran between 2017 and 2021 and was funded with around 8 million euros. So as I said, this is just one of many projects. However, the use of AI is not only being intensively researched, and it is already being used, especially at the outer borders and also in the camps that are 
nowadays very much in line with prison. So what does it mean for people on the move? How does the expanded video surveillance, drones, uh, robot dogs, lie detectors, and the intensified use of language and dialect recognition programs affect the recognition or rejection of people? Who is gaining from it, who makes money with these technologies, and what happens with the data of refugees that is being taken and um, recorded without their consent, and how can people who are affected by it, who are less considered as human beings but much more as a risk, how can they um, do something against it? How can they find redress? So resistance to the inhumane treatment of refugees at the EU's external borders requires not only a technical understanding of digitization, but also an analysis of the narratives, the stories we use to justify this use of technology. So how do we legitimize that people who are in need are considered as a threat or considered criminals or terrorists and need to be, um, we need to defend ourselves against them, even though this might mean that they die. So we are dealing with material borders and also with the borders in our heads. Um, surveys show quite a mixed picture for Germany. This is not a current survey. It's a survey from 2019. And at the time, 71% of the participants in the survey said that they're in favor of the right of asylum. But uh, more than 40% were for closed borders. And of course, this is a paradoxon, which is also reflected in the present day. So the issue of um, migration is being used in order to weaken a democracy. And we could see this in the election results of last Sunday. So it's not a coincidence that an increasingly militarized defense against migrants and an increased anti-feminism are the central goals and objectives that embed a right-wing worldview much deeper in the heart of democratic societies and let the AfD become the second winner of the elections. Um, and we are convinced that the issue of migration and flight must not be left to the right. If we want to defend our democracy against the right, we must engage with people on the run in a differentiated and empathetic way, and we must take a closer look at the surveillance technologies used, and we also must look into the narratives. And this is exactly what we are going to do today. At this point, I would like to invite you to look at the guidelines for our upcoming debates. Maybe we can briefly show these guidelines. Yes, so important for us is think nothing bad at first. So this means that you should assume that the other person is not having any bad intentions, even though um, that person represents a view that you do not share. Share the stage. So share the stage and also the awareness of others. Let the others shine. I mean, I think this is self-explanatory. And uh, you may be right. So please consider that the other person might be right and maybe also ask yourself the question, what if we fail? So what if we do not manage to have a successful dialogue in this framework? So what if we fail? And before I pass the floor to Menja Chalea and Francesca Schmidt, I would like to thank all of you who have supported this conference and who made this conference possible. So my first thank goes to Munzo Tokmet. Munzo Tokmet has had the responsibility in the background um, for yeah, all the administrative aspects, so thank you very much for that. 
and of course to the whole GWI team without uh, whom these kind of conference would not be possible. And I'd also like to thank the event office of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. So Anna was responsible here. And yes, Anna is there. So thank you, Anna. And of course, I'd also like to thank uh, our interpreters. So, I'd also like to convey warm greetings to Badi Saleh, who helped prepare this conference, but unfortunately cannot be here today. Oh, and uh, now I pass the floor to you, Menja, and I hope that we're going to have a nice conference and a fruitful discussion. All right, good morning, everyone, and thank you all for coming. Um, it's really nice to be here, and it's really nice to see all of you this morning here and, um, and for you to participate with us and join the conversation on the digitalization of borders and the production of vulnerabilities. Um, thank you very much, Ines, for this uh, generous introduction, and I would like to kind of continue with the thank yous and start my tiny little speech with this, the thank yous. Firstly, I do thank my co conspirators and partners in crime with whom I had the pleasure to conceive this event and the ideas and, and the conversations that we'll be having today. And these are Francesca, who is right here, and Fadi. Fadi is sadly unable to join us here today, but he will be and he is with us in spirits. I also would like to express my tremendous gratitude to Ines, whose trust, leadership and friendship has led to all of us being here today. Thank you, Ines. <laughs> A huge thanks also goes to Mono, who has facilitated much of the important background work necessary for the successful implementation of today's exchange and to the technical and translation staff. And last but not least, my thanks go to Monica, who will facilitate the two panels today, and to all the speakers who have so generously agreed to offer and share their expertise with us today. So thank you. So this event marks the fifth year of the collaboration between the Queer European Asylum Network and the Gunda Werner Institute. Together, we have organized events on issues around gender, sexuality, and migration with a strong focus on the intersectional forms of LGBTQI plus asylum seekers and refugees in Germany, and with a desire to make an intervention in important policy discussions on the production of vulnerabilities and inequalities. The topics discussed in the context of these events span from the institutional and social challenges LGBTQI plus asylum claimants face during COVID-19, over the potential of the Dublin III return system to obstruct safe pathways for LGBTQI plus asylum claimants to gain refugee protection, and to the implementation of the Istanbul Convention regarding female identifying queer asylum seekers who are survivors of gender-based and sexualized violence. At the center of all these discussions resides the question as of how larger political and legal migration system in the European Union produce forms of marginality and invisibilities along the lines of gender, sexuality, race and ethnicity. So today's event on the digitization of EU borders and the production of vulnerabilities seeks to further extend such conversation with a keen eye on two recently passed EU legislations. These are the new Pact on Migration and Asylum and the EU, EU Artificial Intelligence Act. The EU AI Act was passed by the European Parliament just now in March 2024 and is so far the world's most comprehensive AI law. Over the last, over the last one point decades, digital and artificial intelligence technology has emerged as an important pillar for migration management and biometrics based AI systems, drones and lie detectors are now widely used in the area of migration and asylum within the EU. Considering the vast impact of AI on the so-called management of migration, the European Union Artificial Intelligence Act needs to be considered in conjunction with the policy endeavors stipulated in the new Pact on Migration Asylum. 
The pact, which was formally adopted by the Council of the EU on, on the 14th of May 2024, aims to streamline the procedural management of asylum across the EU and to fast track the asylum process. To achieve the goal of the new pact, the EU is currently heavily investing in the development of prediction tools that can forecast irregular migration flows into the EU for the purpose of border monitoring and detection of security threats. For instance, since 2007, the European Commission has invested over 3 billion euros into research on technology and border security systems. So in light of the increasing global interest in use of AI for the purpose of border control, former UN Special Rapporteur on contemporary forms of racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia and related intolerance, Professor Tendai Achumi, has warned that against a background of political contexts where conservative governments are on the rise, migration prediction and immigration technologies can have serious xenophobic and racially discriminatory consequences for refugees, migrants and stateless persons. In her 2020 report, she writes, and I quote, Governments and non-state actors are developing and deploying emerging, di emerging digital technologies in ways that are uniquely experimental, dangerous and discriminatory in the border and immigration enforcement context. By so doing, they are subjecting refugees, migrants, stateless persons and others to human rights violations and extracting large quantities of data from from them on exploitative terms that strip these groups of fundamental human agency and dignity." Quote end. So for this symposium, we start from the premise that AI and digital technologies for the purpose of migration management are not merely developed and used for simplifying border control and crossing, but they also function as a mode of governance that increasingly shapes life opportunities and impinges on the fundamental rights of migrants, including refugees. This event is thus particularly concerned with, firstly, the framing of AI within the migration context, and secondly, the manner in which digitalization of borders categorizes people on the move as legitimate or illegitimate and as worthy and unworthy. Thank you. Yeah, hello, I just take over for the next five minutes, so, yeah, okay. So, as we delve into these critical discussions, it is imperative to understand the broader implications of digitization, borders, and Europe. The advancement of digital technologies has transformed how borders are conceptualized and enforced, resulting in the virtualization of border control. Technologies such as biometric identification, automated surveillance, and AI-driven decision-making systems are reshaping the experiences of refugees and migrants. These technologies extend borders beyond physical checkpoints, allowing border regimes to intrude into the daily lives of displaced individuals. Those refugees and migrants carry the borders with them, facing continuous monitoring and control that extends beyond ge geographical boundaries. This digitization also worsens existing vulnerabilities and creates new forms of surveillance that disproportionately affect marginalized groups. The intersection of digitalization and border control highlights the production of multiple vulnerabilities. Migrants and refugees are already at risk due to their displacement, face additional layers of scrutiny and control, which can lead to breaches of privacy, arbitrary detentions and deportations. The increasing reliance um, on AI and digital tools in border management can reinforce systematic inequalities, particularly along the lines of race, ethnicity, gender and socioeconomic status. As a black person born in Europe who often passes for white, I recognize these, uh, the critical importance of addressing these intersections and challenges the pervasive structures of racism and discrimination embedded in digital border regimes. 
Moreover, it is crucial to consider the colonial legacies that underpin these technological advancements. The digitalization of border and the use of AI in migration, migration management are not isolated from historical contexts of colonialism and imperialism. These practices perpetuate colonial power dynamics by reinforcing racial hierarchies and excluding marginalized populations. This phenomenon known as technocolonialism, a term used by Professor Mirka Madianu, who is also here with us present today, describes how modern technologies continues the exploitive practices of colonialism, ensuring control and surveillance over marginalized groups. Technocolonialism shifts the attention to the role of to the role that data and digital innovation play in entrenching power asymmetries between refugees and aid agency, ultimately reproducing inequalities in the global context. Understanding these connections is essential to address the root causes of marginalization and to advocate for more equitable and just migration policies. In conclusion, as we embark in this critical dialogue about the digitization of EU borders, let us remain vigilant about the implica implication of these technologies and strive to ensure they ensure they sorry, they do not perpetuate harm or reinforce systematic inequalities. Um, I would like also to thank Menja for her insightful words and join her in expressing gratitude to all our colleagues organizers and participations. We all hope for a fruitful debate and a vibrant exchange of ideas um, today. And now I would like to hand over again to Ines, who will moderate the keynote. Thank you very much. Yeah, ja, and I have now noch mal das Vergnügen auf Deutsch um, unsere I have the pleasure to announce our keynote speaker, Mira Giorgio. Mira Giorgio is a professor of media and communication at the London School of Economics. Um, she is the author and editor of five books and more than 60 articles in so-called peer-reviewed publications, and especially on digitization and migration, sometimes in connection of the two topics, but sometimes also digitization um, in general. Her work has been published in English, French, Portuguese, Japanese, and Greek. And she's also worked as a consultant for a number of regional and international organizations most um, notably for the Council of Europe. Um, she's the author of quite a number of national and international uh, media. And uh, as I cannot mention all the articles uh, that have already been published by her. I'd just like to point to a few books. So 2023, the book Being Human in Digital Cities was published. This is the most recent book that I would highly recommend. Before that, she wrote the book uh, together with uh, her colleague Julia Raki with the title The Digital Border, Migration, Technology, Power. This is actually the basis for today's conference and also her keynote. And she also published the Sage Handbook on Media of Media and Migration in 2020. And um, this is the most recent one, um, uh, the oldest one rather, uh, 10 years ago. She um, published Media and the City, Cosmopolitanism and Difference. Um, and we will hope surely hear this in the keynote. Uh, her work is characterized by our understanding of technologies uh, and she's connecting this with the media work and the analysis of narratives in a great work. So I'm quite happy that you're here.
Okay, so thank you all for being here. Uh, special thanks, of course, for the kind invite to um, uh, the organizing team, Ines, and Menja, and Francesca. Thank you to the foundation and, of course, the uh, Gunther Werner Institute. Um, so I think we have already uh, heard uh, um, some interesting thinking points set by the organizing committee, and I'm going to build on some of these uh, um, arguments that they have raised, and I'm going to do so by drawing partly in the book that I co-authored with my colleague Lili Hularaki, but also uh, adding to that more recent research uh, that I have conducted in this field, and also thinking through some of the key challenges around the AI, um, EU AI Act that we're presented with now and the new challenges that presents. So, I think we have all seen images like that of the digital borders, power, contradiction, but also its inherent resistance. Most of us know how, uh, and are well aware of how consistently and persistently state and corporate actors have been promoting the different infrastructures that now make migrations technologized governance. Of course, the genealogy of technologized border is very long. It's not something that we are just starting to talk about now. But if we think of the last few decades, we can see the gradual centering of technologies, of digital technologies, in constructing practices and meanings of the border. Digital technologies, we now know, have become embedded in high-tech infrastructures of surveillance of the border, including for example, biothermal, long range, the so-called smart cameras and drones. Even more recently, the digital border has incorporated big data analysis and modeling as core technologies of the border, collecting enormous amounts of data across different locations, uh, stored and shared in transnational databases of security and cross-border control. And that brings us to the now, when in addition to big data, biometrics and smart cameras, AI is taking center stage in border control innovations. And of course, when we talk about AI, let us remind ourselves that AI is not something new, is not something limited and contained in very specific pra uh, practices. We all have AI in our pockets right now. Uh, so it's not AI per se that we're um, trying to discuss here, but AI, especially generative AI, is mobilized within specific um, uh, systems of border governance. So AI seems in this context to be taking center stage in border control innovations, at least so it appears, as automated systems of detection and control of ir irregular mobility across borders, we are now told, will overcome human biases, errors, and most importantly, perhaps, costly human-led operations. The future is here, we are told, and we can see that in that illustration by the US Customs and Borders Protection, which illustrates how, what the AI border is about. So, as we see there, we're moving from the border of operational deficiencies to the border of operational benefits. It is less often uh, that we hear about the contradictions of the digital border, and this is our opportunity, I think, here in, in, in settings like the one that we share today here, to talk about the, also the contradictions of the digital border, as the diffusion of digital technologies means at the same time that the same technologies that authorities use to monitor migrant lives are the technologies that are very often vital for migrants to sustain life, to connect to loved ones, to seek safety. And when we think of the digital border, we even less often hear about it as a site of struggle. Struggle of power for control, but also for freedom. Migrant activist and academic interventions, for example, remind us that the border might be intended for security, but perhaps precisely because of that, 
it presents us with urgent challenges about protection of rights, rights to life, dignity, and belonging within and across borders. So in this talk, I want to speak to the digital border in these three dimensions. I will first uh, uh, speak to the digital border's manifestations and techniques of power and control, at least as it mobilizes technologies to enact its intended power and control over human mobility. I will do so by paying particular attention to the ever-expanding speciality and temporality of the border. The border now spreads across territories from national outer borders of European uh, outer borders of the EU to European cities and from the continent of Europe to Africa the border seems to be always and everywhere present. Secondly, I want to move to discussing the border as a system of governance which needs to be understood through its inherent contradictions as a system that manages security but also rights, opening up opportunities for humans to move to seek safety and belonging while at the same time and in the name of security conditioning migrants or potential migrants to increasing risks for well-being dignity, and even for life itself. I will thirdly and finally uh, um, uh, speak, and with a focus uh, on the EU AI Act, speak to the border as a site where technology is used to both exercise control and resistance. I will try to show that the digital turn of migration governance is not just about smoothening operations, as we're being told here, and incorporating innovation. It is also about political contestations around migrants' access to human and civil rights. And throughout this talk, I'm going to be bringing uh, uh, um, uh, uh, at different points. Uh, I will be bringing in voices and experiences of migrants as they are the actors around whom the border is constructed, but who are rarely heard uh, or uh, considered as decision-making actors of the border. These are voices recorded uh, by uh, my uh, research collaborations in different contexts and by myself over eight years of research across Europe and which I share here with respect and awareness of responsibility towards the people who entrusted those stories uh, to my research team and myself. So the data that I'm sharing here and the voices I'm sharing are shared after, and the images uh, I'm sharing, uh, appropriate consent has been um, uh, uh, given by the participants to do so. Hmm. I think... Oh, okay. I don't have very intelligent visuals, I just have some visuals. <laughs> so let me speak first about the digital border and what I mean with the ever-expanding infrastructure of human mobility control. So the border, of course, is not new. We're not having these conversations because AI or big data suddenly appeared in our lives. Of course, the border has been a stable structure uh, and fundamental structure of the modern nation state. For a long time, as we know, the border has been constituted as a line uh, drawn on specific places in the map and usually literally a line that usually has been drawn after wars to recognize the sovereignty of states and more recently, of course, the sovereign, uh, the sovereign territory of the EU. So the conventional wisdom and the uh, historical knowledge around the nation state assumes that the border refers to that stable line that separates the sovereign territory of a state or of the EU from the outside. Yet, and as we more acutely now realize, especially with the technologization of the border, its design, purpose and imagination have become much more than that. We now see most apparently, and largely because of digitization, that the border is now both rigid and mobile. Still, that line on the map, of course, exists. It is, uh, uh, but it also moves across time and space, as I will try to explain. 
It is externalized through checkpoints, European Union checkpoints, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, and thousand, uh, thousands of miles away from the physical European territory. It also moves when migrants carry the border in their pockets, and as their smartphones become a surveillance technology that the state effectively use to monitor migrant bodies' mobility. So the border now is constituted as an assemblage of human and non-human actors that aim to control mobility as well as rights across territories and across time. Let me explain a bit more what I mean. So the digital border is of course manifested still in the assemblage of technologies that aim to control entry into national territories or entry into the EU. At the outer border of states and of the EU, we see the first paradox of the digital border as an assorting mechanism allowing certain humans to cross while stopping others. At airports, for example, digital technologies aim to make the border seamless, almost invisible for those seen as worthy of the right to cross. With data checks taking place online and before travelers even reach the physical border, and with friction at the airport avoided through automated scanning of biometric data and as little contact with border guards as possible, privileged travelers who usually um, uh, use airports are supposed to have a quick contactless experience of global interconnectedness. At the same time, the outer border becomes hyper-visible for those who automated systems deem as risky. <clears throat> At crossing points where irregular migrants are more likely to cross, especially territorial borders, for example in northern Greece or in southern US states, we see the border unlike the technologies of the, uh, of the airports, we see the same technologies being used to make the border hyper-visible. So in such places, we see the assemblage of analog and digital technologies and actors whose uniforms, training and tools create hostile conditions of crossing. From high fences and dogs to cameras and drones, the outer border aims to deter and technologies are there to make that visible. So this first contradiction of the digital border shows that first, bordering techniques of power are always relational. So we have different kinds of rights and actors who cross or should cross or should not. Second, these techniques are increasingly enacted through the identification of people's profiles and automation of predictive risk attributed differently to different individuals. And third, decisions are based on accumulation of da data that happens in opaque ways. <coughs> Sorry, and this is, I think, very important, the opacity and the invisibility of behind decision making. So for example, it's very often unclear how each of our data profiles is constituted and evaluated. It is often, and most of us probably have such profiles, it is often produced on transnational databases that accumulate different kinds of data and put together by different actors, human and non-human, and it is often unclear why certain individuals are deemed risky and others are not. Are people, individuals, deemed risky because they have harmed others? Are they deemed risky because they have participated in protests for, demo uh, for democratization of their country? Or is it because of their origin, their racial or class profile? Often, not even those in charge know the answer to those questions. What we do know is that within border governance, humans are more likely to be categorized as data, data evaluated based on levels of risks, and much less so as humans to engage with on the basis of rights. The second contradiction of the border is its elasticity in time and space. The digital border now is so much more than that stable point in the map. 
The digital border now moves with migrants, migrants who cross territories and those imagined as doing so or intending to do so in the future. What do I mean? The border expands across territories both inside and, out, and across states. First, it expands within the territory of the nation. As more and more we now know, the border is enacted not only on border security governance, but also in the governance of cities, education, health, work and housing. Cities especially become sites of unending bordering where migrants and other racialized communities uh, uh, de uh, build their lives while still being always watched. As Ben Green notes um, in a recent publication on the border, smart city technologies make it now almost impossible to avoid being tracked. And Matt Mahmoudi, for his research for Amnesty International, also shows that it is those same technologies of facial recognition and predictive policing that are being used in cities, in cities from London all the way to Hebron, to, uh, with the aim to target, identify, and perhaps prosecute specific racialized people whose mere existence is considered to be a risk. Tazioli refers to routinized extractive practices of everyday surveillance that create data profiles for individuals deemed as risky. I will speak in a while about the exceptionalism of national and European law, for example, in the right uh, uh, to pri of privacy and data protection when it comes to migrants. But let me... Um, now uh, uh, bring in some of the experiences, one of the experiences that uh, captures this expansion of the border within European cities. So my colleagues and I, for example, repeatedly recorded within our cross-European project, Digital City of Refuge, the constant pressure that many migrants across European cities are uh, undergoing all the time as they're expected to perform to their data profile. The data profile that is created for them at the outer border when they enter European uh, uh, territories, but which continue being fed with their everyday practices when they live in cities. Not only we saw in our research the border expanding across spaces, but also across times. time. For many migrants, encountering the border can happen anywhere and at any point in their lives. For example, Hadi, a young Syrian refugee in London, explained to us how he feels that he always has to perform as the British state expects, uh, expects him to do so that the authorities see that Syrian refugees are actually good people. What does he mean with that? So he explained to us that he's very well aware that his case of being granted asylum in the UK is based on evidence about his desire to work and to contribute to the society. This means that even though he's struggling financially, he has to agree to volunteer and work for free in a commercial uh, shop chain uh, that benefits from his labor so that the job center can provide the can produce the data um, that will fit in his case uh, about asylum and which evidence, uh, evidences that actually Syrian people are good and actually he's willing to contribute to the society and work, even for free. We heard uh, of many others who hesitated to... We heard from uh, many other participants that they hesitate to seek health care as they feel that their health records might feed back into the border authorities. Often these fears are unfounded, but the spread of fear and misinformation in themselves around migration governance is indicative or in their own right. So uh, they, in fact, those rumors, they, in fact, uh, reveal the symbolic construction of the border. That is, how digital technologies of communication are used to spread information and misinformation about migration. 
Fears around information and misinformation accumulates when actually the regime of migration governance and its decision making are opaque, untransparent, and offer punitive as a result of those automated and predictive uh, policing and data profiling systems that actually are very difficult for many people to navigate and understand and act accordingly. Many more participants explained to us that they are well aware of how the border moves with them, especially through their pocket-sized technology of the smartphone, to which I will return when I discuss the contradictions inherent in the digital border. At least three participants in Berlin, for example, told us that they are very cautious on what they discuss on social media, as they know that at any time their digital profiles might be monitored. The elastic speciality of the border is not only internal, but it's also external. The externalization of the European border takes place through a series of agreements between the EU and uh, uh, many countries outside the EU, for example, in North and Sub-Saharan Africa, where countries are asked to act as EU's proxy border guards when they are provided with digital infrastructures and training to deter potential migrants for, from reaching Europe, only expected to do that while they are thousands of, mi of miles away from the actual European territory. The externalization of the border, we know, makes access to rights of protection and adherence to human rights yet more opaque and hard to monitor. Data banks and other private corporations control those externalized border infrastructures and end up holding much more power to decide on thousands of people's lives now, in the future, in unpredictable temporalities of their lives. Having concentrated power across time and space that data and those who manage them hold, and this is power that very often is large and sometimes much bigger than that of public institutional actors who actually have specific obligations and who are accountable to citizens. So this talks aims to speak to the digital border's complexity, and so far I uh, try to highlight its spatial and temporal elasticity and the ways in which digital technologies that both border guards and migrants use um, to make the border, to make the border elastic, relational, and mobile. I want to now speak a bit more to the digital border's inherent contradiction. And this contradiction is most acutely visible in the responsibility that the border carries now as both a mechanism to ensure security and to grant rights. As a national or European uh, mechanism of security, the border now classifies migration as one of the key domains where the securitization logic of the state unfolds. And let us remind ourselves that this has not always been the case. While migration has for long been used to racially discriminate um, and to order societies, migration seen as, the par as a par excellence security concern is actually a quite recent phenomenon. And one uh, only has to go about, uh, back about 20 or 30 years to see the, uh, how marginal migration was in public conversations and in mainstream politics uh, across Europe. So we know that this, uh, the securitization and the uh, alert around uh, migration as a security concern is quite recent and it is intensified within the rising xenophobic, Islamophobic and right-wing politics of polarization as also we saw in the recent election results. So within the same politics of securitization, citizenship rights have also become more and more an issue handled through the complex and, as I said already, the elastic border. Asylum, for example, the rights of refugees, the right to seek asylum as a refugee, is now dealt with as much as an issue of rights, as much as an issue of security. For example, citizenship rights 
In addition, citizenship rights in some European countries are not for life anymore. They are not for life for people whose blood is considered as not being indigenous. So, for example, in the UK, if you're of a migrant background and you're a citizen, or even if your parents are of migrant background, you can lose your citizenship at any time if you're considered as a threat of the case. And there has been a very prominent case recently uh, where this actually happened, where a girl who has never been um, in, uh, in the country where her parents came from is actually told that she's not British anymore because she represents a threat to the state. So the convergence of security and rights means that, as uh, Yuval Davis and colleagues uh, put it, bordering constructions are intimately linked to different constructions of identity, belonging, and citizenship. And what does that mean for migrants' rights to belong and to actually claim and sustain citizenship. So I would like to uh, come back to our participants and bring back some of the voices of our participants, especially voices from people in Berlin, since we're here, uh, who uh, we engage with within our project, The Digital City of Refuge, a project that tried to understand the politics of the digital border ex experienced by those arriving and those receiving them in the, uh, in the years after the uh, 2015 so-called crisis in Athens, Berlin, and London. Many of the people we engage with were Syrian refugees. These are people who benefited from a system of migration governance that recognized their right to asylum, or at least to seek asylum. A system that allowed them to settle in this city where we are, to seek community to restart their lives. For many of them, asylum couldn't have come soon enough after uprooting and for many after experiencing enormous trauma. One of them is Ali, a transgender person from Syria, previously imprisoned in Syria as a woman and who transitioned after arriving in Germany as a refugee. Here are some of their words that bring together that contradictory experience of the border, a mix of relief, pain, and anger. So Ali uh, said to us, yes, the German, pay, uh, the German state paid for my operations, and I'm incredibly thankful for that. That I thank Germany for, but the rest, no. The re rest gets no thanks from me. I'm so tired, so tired by everything, by the Syrian community, by the German government, everything. You get to a point where you can't trust anything around you anymore. I don't know what they call this, but this is really tiring. The question why hangs over everything. You no longer see justifications for things around you. Why? Maybe because we're part of a bigger game. Maybe because politically everything is the result of a particular agenda. Even our coming here, even our coming here was because Germany wants workers, more people to pay taxes. And okay, I will do that, but treat as well. Another female participant in Berlin, Malaka, who has managed to build a successful career here as a chef, uh, as a chef, now enjoys certain benefits of a peaceful and prosperous life, not least her professional success, for which she is very proud of, and the recognition of her talent, which is wide, uh, uh, widespread. But this recognition seems to come at a high cost. She told us that she feels she always has to prove something, a hard job, she admitted. And we asked her, what does she have to prove? Ah, okay. Thank you. Okay. I have to prove that we're not what the media here portray us to be. This is something facing Syrians in particular. We're not criminals. We're not here to take money from the state. The media here is full of those portrayals. German, Germans also look around and think we're using their taxes to eat and hang out in restaurants and have fun. We need to show them that we're not here to waste their money, that we have escaped war, that we are enterprising. 
and will stand on our two feet, support ourselves. I'm most proud of the fact that I have been able to show this, to prove this. The media, as they mobilize technologies of communication to circulate narratives of migrants as people to either feel sorry of or to be scared of, uh, thus either being victims or perpetrators, symbolically perpetuate the border we see here, reminding both citizens and non-citizens that no matter how much migrants might achieve, no matter what they have overcome, the border that separates them as racialized others from white citizens remains ever-present and solid. We see here what Yuval David and colleagues call everyday bordering, the process of symbolically constituting and intersectionally manifesting divisions between those who belong and those who don't. In the case of Ali, we see how they experience unbelonging, always been seen as being outside the border of the community. In their words, we see how they know that day in, day out, the border symbolically always reaffirms otherness. We also see how aware both Malaka and Ali are of how the national and European politics of identity require from them a performative refugeeness. They are both well aware, but with a lot of pain, of what is expected and accepted in terms of how they perform their gender, racial, and class roles, and how they always have to do so and exist as grateful refugees. These examples highlight how the digital border operates symbolically. But the digital border we saw also operates territorially. Everyday ordinary communication and the pocket-sized technology of the smartphone has now become in itself a technology associated with what Kile Bembe refers to as the necropolitics of the border. Interestingly and importantly, Euro Europe's securitized border has become much more dangerous now with the advance of digitization and the different technologies of monitoring compared to 2015 and its immediate aftermath. Conducting research across Europe across all these years, in 2015 and 2016, I would hear repeatedly how uh, different migrants would use smartphones as a life-saving technology when they were crossing and also uh, I would hear many stories about how state and non-state actors would use the technologies, the GPS technologies of smartphones, to actually support those who were at risk. More, more recently, I've heard exactly the opposite stories. Oops. The one... The once life-saving smartphone is now a life-threatening technology. As we have heard among a number of teenage uh, refugees that my team and I interviewed in the, in the context of an EU-funded project, Y Skills, in the last three years. And here, uh, the really moving, I think, uh, words of one of our uh, teenage participants that explains what I mean. Because we came in an illegal way, and they told us we shouldn't have a phone. In general, not just when we crossed the border, I left it back in Lebanon, and nobody had a phone. At the border, they have something to monitor, a radar, and they detect mobile phones. Nobody had a mobile phone. It was difficult not to have a mobile during this time. My mother was very worried about us. I was worried about my mother. She didn't know anything about us because she read in the news in Syria that some people died while crossing in Europe or that some people actually died because they were shot. So she got worried because of what she read in the news. It was very dangerous because they shot them at sea. They died. 
I cannot say how many times I've heard similar stories in the last couple of years and while conducting uh, uh, research um, across Europe. And of course, in an even more moving way, this research, again, to emphasize, is with young people, with teenagers. Another story I, I was told involved the witnessing of the death of a friend at sea. And that was a story told by a teenage boy. Throwing away phones is often the only choice for those who actually have digital literacy, not for those who don't. Digital literacy in the context of the digital borders, sometimes we see, means that technology actually has to go before hope for reaching safety does. So technology works. It works for the border, but at what cost? And this brings me to the last part of my talk, how technological innovations, more recently AI, have been used to produce and reproduce a state of exception for migrant lives and bodies, and how this exceptionalization is being challenged, of course, and is constantly challenged by migrants themselves, grassroots and international organizations. The incorporation of digital innovations in governance, many researchers such as Dana Boyd or Stefanie Milan have repeatedly shown, are often mobilized within a framework of technosolutionism. Technological innovations are invested in as solutions to complex problems, such as human mobility, migration. Sometimes, if we return to the uh, digital border, the technologies are often mobilized to address problems that either do not exist, for example, the flood of migrants coming to our borders, or as solutions for problems that have nothing to do with technology. Most importantly, problems such as inequality, polarization, and racism. Technosolutionism is often uh, driving public policy decision-making precisely because it appears as neutral and, as and effective. Technologies are being mobilized as the optimal response to perceived or real problems. And this is a case that we see in different fields, but of course also in increasingly in migration governance. Importantly, we're currently living at this critical moment about the way that we think about technology, technological innovation and change, especially in Europe, when it comes to this trajectory, perhaps, of technosolutionism. We see growing concerns, caution, and effectively regulation of the power of those designing, selling, and controlling technological innovations. In fact, in different parts of the world, EU is envied by many national and international human rights campaigners who see e uh, European Union's attempt to regulate big tech as a commitment to the protection of citizens from digital risks. The AI Act is one of those examples. So far, so good. This is where the state seems to become an actor protecting rights, even an actor that resists the ever-growing power of the tech giants. Only at the same time, there are serious concerns that the state of exception is being put in place, reminding us that not all humans have the same right to life and dignity. In fact, with migration in the AI Act and within other regulatory frameworks for uh, digital innovation, what we see is a normalization of a state of exception when it comes to migrants' human rights and civil rights. If we move away from the AI Act in particular, for example, we know that in a number of European countries, migrants, especially asylum seekers, are exempt from the right to privacy of data and of uh, protection of personal communication in the name of national security or just merely because this is part of general migration policies. More significantly, migrants' social media and smartphones 
in many European countries can be screened at any time if authorities consider the users as in any way suspicious. As Ajak and a colleague just wrote just a couple of weeks ago um, in, a, in a research piece, asylum seekers' fundamental rights are under threat as they at any point are asked to surrender their phones for screening in a number of European countries. As Daria Osgul um, uh, wrote in relation to, uh, to her research in Germany, asylum seeker smartphones can be confiscated at any time to be screened and searched by the state, but also by private corporations that cooperate with the state. Also, many of the bordering technologies used uh, uh, by the state and by the EU, have been tested on populations before they are applied in the EU, have been tested on populations with little access to real or informed consent. Face recognition and some of the biometrical innovations, for example, have first been tested on refugee camps across the Middle East and on Palestinians in the occupied territories. Migrants themselves, of course, and many migrants, uh, uh, of course, are acutely aware of the power of bordering techniques, mobilized at any point to determine not only the conditions of their lives, but sometimes the right to life itself. During fieldwork, we repeatedly heard how many migrants have multiple social media profiles and more than one phones engaging in small acts of resistance that reduce this, the risk of punitive surveillance. Such acts of resistance are important, as research has shown again and again, because we know now that there are arbitrary judgments um, that are being made in relation to people's life based on information that people exchange or do not exchange on social media and which can be used um, uh, for different purposes. For example, we know that a number of European countries um, only, uh, uh, only grant uh, asylum to LGBTQI applicants if they can prove on the smartphones that they are involved in LGBTQI activities. We can talk about how problematic that is. And we know, of course, how risky for democracy is the, the tweet witch hunt, which we have seen again and again recently, that normalizes decision making that denies certain actors the right to speak in European publics because of certain voices and, uh, and claims that are not widely accepted. We saw also, as discussed earlier, how migrants engage in acts of resistance, yet not without cost. Sometimes huge cost, as we saw in the case of people who throw their phone at sea. Or, as reports from the outer borders of Europe claim, by burning out their fingertips in order to avoid fingerprint identification on transnational databases. Alongside those small and often risky acts of resistance, we also know how civil society, including but, including but not limited to migrant organizations, refuse to accept the digital state of exception. The EU, I, um, the EU AI Act has itself become a case raising concerns of migrant e exceptionalization, but also of contestation and resistance to the digital border. And in fact, and as pointed in different campaigns, such as the one led by the hashtag protect nor surveil civil society coalition, the act's protection does not ex extend to migrants, which arguably is a, it's a constituency, constituency that brings together some of the most vulnerable people, some of the people who, ha who should have more protection, actually, than others. So, for example, the Protect Not Survey Coalition um, emphasizes that predictive modeling can be used to stop and push back potential migrants that, uh, that fall within automated categories that are deemed risky or not deserving protection. 
They also know that there are no provisions in the Act for individuals' protection from the use of the very problematic and often biased lie, lie detectors that the EU has the ambition to roll out at its borders. The Act also has little consideration, activists say, if any, against the risks associated with forecasting tools that model uh, future patterns of migration. These are themselves very often unreliable and develop on the basis of data accumulated and analyzed again in opaque ways without many of us being aware on what basis, which are different stages of their development, offer create and reproduce hidden racial, gendered and class biases and discrimination. Okay. To conclude, let me uh, recap and share some questions with you. As I tried to argue in this talk, the digital border is now an assemblage of human and non-human actors, from border guards to big tech to smartphones and smart cameras to migrants themselves. In different ways, these actors shape dynamic and and deeply unequal specialities and temporalities in which so much is at stake. For the future of those who move or need to move, especially those trying to avoid war and destitution, and equally importantly, for the future of societies such as the European societies and their own moral compass and adherence to national and international law. These are societies that have been shaped through human mobility not now, not in the last 50 years, but throughout their histories, but, but which now exists with, uh, with that specter of migration, a specter that has been created by xenophobic politics originating in the racist and Islamophobic far right, but which, uh, in a worrying way, are now becoming also normalized by the center. The digital border and its techno-solutionism outsource a political crisis to a seemingly technological wonder of digital optimization. Migration is a crisis, we are told, and with smart technologies at hand, we will manage it. Yet what in fact happens is that the techno-solutionism of the uh, migration governance displaces accountability and obscures the violence of the border as much as its divisive techniques that assort people on the basis of origin, race, gender and sexuality. And it does so because the actors of violence, symbolically and at some uh, points uh, materially as well, are not seen to be humans. They're just machines. Automation and the outsourcing of responsibility to machines fails both the sides of life and the sides of rights. At the milieu, when we have so many technologies that allow us to save lives, we see more and more lives lost at the wet and dry border. This is a paradox of the cruel necropolitics of the digital border. At the same time, concerns for human rise, uh, rights are on the rise. We see a trajectory of migration governance where discrimination and denial of rights becomes a job of automated systems. At the same time, and even more cynically, we see technologies of the border converging with technologies of war. So-called smart borders and smart bombs develop hand in hand, often by the same corporations, only to remind us how often their smartness is more of a political claim rather than a technological achievement. So the questions that this um, uh, generates for me is about responsibilities, first of all. So what responsibilities does the digital border call for and for whom? How can, in fact, uh, and, uh, can, how can we, in fact, understand the risks and benefits of digital infrastructures at times of fast technological innova uh, innovation? And what do we learn and what, uh, what do we earn and what do we lose if we choose to tell a particular st story of migration and effectively of Europe 
by starting and ending by focusing on technology and our fascination or fear with its potentialities. Would the story of migration and effectively of Europe be different if we actually start and perhaps end with consideration for democratic accountability, humanist values and fundamental rights? Thank you. Mira, thank you so much for this great journey you took us with you and um, from and, and um, giving us a first overview of all the contradictions coming around technology and I'm now it's the time for Q&A now it's the time for your questions please prepare and um, maybe bef while you're preparing um, I'll start with one question for you um, regarding your research I mean you're doing this research now for years and um, as you were outlining the the atmosphere becomes more and more hostile more and more life is, lives are lost. What impact has this hostility on your research? Does it, does it have any? Thank you. Um, yes, it works. Yes, yeah, just you. <laughs> um, the impact uh, of hostility on my research. I mean, first of all, hostility has impact on people's lives, the people we engage with. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, as researchers, we realize even more the... Uh, our responsibility when we, uh, we, when we engage with people whose lives are more and more at risk. And, and again, I want to emphasize also people's dignities are also at risk because we shouldn't be on, only thinking about their life. Um, what kind of contribution do you make uh, with your research? And so, so there, there is a moral responsibility, there, there is a difficult uh, emotional space, but I think there is also learning uh, through, uh, through these um, transformations of the digital border. And the transformations of the digital border seem to be much less about the transformations of technology and much more about the transformation of politics around migration. And I think this is what I'm hoping comes across, that if we think about technology, it, it's because it is important how technology is mobilized. The same technology that could save life, the same technology can be mobilized to lose lives. So think always about technology in that bigger context of, of, of change, of global change, European and national change. Thank you. Do you have questions? My colleague Mono is providing with a mic. And maybe you introduce yourself very quickly that we know whom we're talking to. Um, yeah, I'm Christina Carter. I work at the Stiftung Wissenschaft and Politik, Security Research Institute. Um, and um, yeah, thank you very much for your talk. You mentioned the IE Act, and I wanted to know if you could elabor elaborate a bit more on if it changes anything for border and migration control, like as so, so if you have some examples what it changes in concrete questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Obviously, I'm not a legal expert. We have legal experts in the room that can say a bit more. Um, but I, I, I think there's something particular and something more general uh, that uh, are worth mentioning again as a non-expert in relation to the AI Act. Uh, one, I think it, it, we have to sit in the continuity of the digital policies on a European level in all its good dimensions in a way that um, uh, it reflects EU's realization and concerns about how we have to think of uh, technological innovations in relation to citizenship rights, pro um, uh, protection against uh, harm and so on. Right? And there is certain continuity when it comes to the exceptionalization of migrants that I mentioned, that there are different national and European uh, regulations that actually seem to uh, to reflect uh, 
that normalization that certain groups of people can be excluded, not necessarily we don't really know why they're excluded. It's just becoming normal now that migrants can be excluded from data protection, from uh, AI, um, pot potential harms, and so on. So I think that there's a contradiction, and again, I think that uh, uh, there are organized campaigns that uh, illustrate uh, those uh, much more clearly. Uh, so, so, so there's a general trend, uh, uh, very quickly, and, and there's the specific that has to do with the intensification of automation. Right. So again, both the uh, good side of the act and the perhaps you know the challenges when it comes to borders is that um, um, the AI act is dealing with these very opaque technologies that present even more challenges to us because again we don't know how they work and especially in relation to migration, these uh, uh, kind of have. Um, some new implications that we're still not fully aware of. Sorry. No, thank you. Thank you. I just want to give the audience the, the space. And um, also, I forgot to say, if you want to ask your question in German, just do so. We translate it then. Don't feel shy, please. So we have um, a question here and then in front. And one over there. And uh, well, hello. My name is Ulrike Peters and I'm a student of Peace and Security Studies at EFSH in Hamburg. First of all, thank you so much for this very insightful presentation you held. Um, I just finished my master thesis on digital coercion, where I discussed with people who want to live as less re uh, reliant on um, Google, Amazon, etc. So want to work with open source software, want to live as free as from digital coercion as they can. And I was just wondering, listen to, listening to your presentation on how people, uh, migrants purposefully um, put away the phones, throw them away, and then come to Europe. Is it more or less harmful for them to have a smartphone coming here? So being present in social media, etc., like showing that they have an active life, showing how good they are, with big marks, of course. And the next question I have, um, looking at the upcoming high chance of having a chat control implemented in Europe or in the EU, um, how do you think will this uh, further influence the situation of migrants, given that the well, we will then have the possibility of every um, police institution being able to read all of our chats? Thank you. Thank you very much. So maybe we 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 take one more question here in front, Francesca, and then. Thank you. Very quickly. You also talked about citizenship and I was wondering, is the concept of citizenship changing with digital borders? And if so, how? Thank you. Um, thank you. So there are three uh, questions. Sorry, I'll try to be brief. Uh, the right to disconnect. Um, I, I think what you're saying is that actually... Um, you know, does it reduce risk, right, to disconnect compared to, to being always online? Uh, this is a conversation that I very often have with colleagues also who do critical data studies, for example, in, in, in my field. Um, my experience with migrants and other racialized groups is that that conversation about the right to disconnect that is now developing and it's very attractive and very important, it does not really take into account the fact that usually the, those in the margins depend much more on those digital networks. And this is the paradox, that it is the people who are more at risk that are actually more dependent in these technologies. Um, so... Yes, probably, you know, many migrants would be safer without being on social media all the time. But then, you know, their mom wants them to be on social media because they, have, they haven't seen their mom for five years, right? So, so I, I think this is the paradox of marginality that digitization makes even more, you know, this kind of inability to resist to the power of the big tech, 
uh, from the margins. Um, the, I think the same answer goes about the surveillance, the full surveillance um, of people's personal messages and, and so on. Yes, again, we know there's lots of evidence that it is the people on the, at the margins that are, tend to be more silver, uh, surveilled um, or who have more at stake. We might all be surveilled, but you know, if you're in a privileged position, okay, they might bombard you with more advertising. But if you're in the margins, <laughs> as a racialized person, there's more at stake for your well-being. Uh, uh, citizenship, I think it's connected to some of these dimensions. It is an idea that I've been thinking more recently that actually I think the framework of citizenship uh, rights and belonging to, to a community, to a national community, um, has shifted, especially again for certain communities at the margin, from being only a matter of rights and defined in relation to those agreed rules of what this community is, to becoming a question of security for certain populations. And I think this is really worrying because we do have different kinds of citizens now. Uh, because again, if you're in a privileged position, citizenship is all about rights. Citizenship is all about freedom. But for many other people, it's not. Thank you. Then I saw you uh, a question over there. And maybe we, if there is one more, we take it together. Don't see it. So please. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was really oh. insightful and, and new information for me. Um, I'm working on the EU's human rights diplomacy with regards to women's rights in the Horn of Africa. So those topics are somehow also close to, close to me. I wonder, because you touched upon the change of narrative in your last part, if you could elaborate a bit more on it, how can this actually happen in practice? How can we yeah, regain the digital space where right-wing extremism has yeah, just gone so wild? Um, and how can this narrative shift yeah, happen in practice? Thank you. And here we have a second question. So we're already there. Uh, yes, hello. Thank you so much for your speech. I'm Caroline uh, from the National Council of German Women's Organizations. In German, it's much shorter, Deutsche Frauenrat. And um, I wonder, you, we're talking about the everyday border uh, bordering and also about the techno-solutionism. And I, I wanted to know, how are the gendered effects of those? Can you tell, go more into it? And I wanted also to add to what my predecessor said, how to counter those narratives, because those are not just media narratives, but also from the policy side. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I, I think every person in this room has the same question. How do we change the narrative and how uh, does this uh, change policy? But you have the answer. <laughs> And, and of course, I am not wiser than, uh, than anybody else in the room. But um, I, I mean, as a researcher, I mean, the one thing that uh, my, my little speck, I think, of trying to contribute to changing the narrative for me is that importance of collaborative, co-creative research that puts in the, uh, in, in the center of our contribution the voices and the agency of, uh, of marginalized people um, as individuals, but also as organized constituencies um, that do actually contest that narrative and do actually want to change policy all the time. Um, and it is these small acts, I think, of voice and resistance that we have to recognize a bit more. That's uh, the only thing I can contribute to, and I'm sure there's more wisdom in the room than mine. Um, the everyday bordering and techno-solutionism techno does, uh, you know, the, the gender dimensions. Uh, absolutely. I mean, all this kind of uh, um, the techniques or of bordering, they do have uh, gender and racial and, and class uh, um, and so on, so on dimensions. Um, I mean, um, for example, the, um, 
women are very often very uh, expected to play very specific roles within um, everyday uh, everyday bordering. Especially, women are expected very often to be the ultimate victim. And women who do not act that role of the victim are very often seen suspiciously because they do not fit categories of that very narrow way of categorizing. And what um, automation has done is to um, not to produce, but to exacerbate categorization of people. So the... Uh, the migrant is victim or is perpetrator is not necessarily contained in, in, in technological uh, frameworks, but it has become much more prominent uh, with, um, with technology because data profiles, for example, of individuals categorize their acts uh, um, based on these categories. Uh, Technosolutionism, again, there are different ways to, to answer this question. Uh, one of the ways that I have seen it in my research is that emphasis, uh, emphasis on the uh, digitally savvy uh, refugee, uh, and it's a big thing also in Germany, I think, that uh, many refugees are expected to um, overcome their victimhood by becoming digital entrepreneurs. Um, and when I was doing my research in Germany, there was disproportionate and a huge investment on digital projects, digital training, uh, digital entrepreneurship. And this by far was uh, a male-dominated sphere. Um, so we can think of, of many different examples. Sorry about the rumbling, but you know, just thinking about some specifics. Thank you so much, Mira. I think we come to an end. Now um, I would like to invite you to have coffee, to relax, have converse conversation um, with each other. And we are going to see each other in 15 minutes again for our first panel. Okay.